this conference is about the future of Christian thinking, uh, I take this phrase in one of its obstinately literal senses, what is the future towards which Christian thinking thinks? And indeed that echoes uh, David's beginning as well. That's not frivolous phrase splicing. I'm convinced that the future of Christian thinking depends vitally on the way in which it envisions future. In other words, on the quality of its hope, especially in the world in which we find ourselves, in which even the futures that we most confidently and actively plan are entirely opaque, not only in their particulars, but in their basic shape and quality. Christianity speaks into this profound shattering of horizons in two ways. One, by refusing to set horizons any narrower than creation's love and desire for God and God's love for creation. And two, by thereby enabling us to live with profound existential uncertainties within the world of the ordinary. Kierkegaard's absolute relation to the absolute enables the right kind of relative relation to the relative, responding to the claims of this world without being suffocated by them. Uh, and that certainly ties in with, uh, with David's critique of too absolute a relation uh, to, relative, to relative powers within this world. I aim to make my case in three relatively brief steps. First, I will recall us to the history of Christian thought about the last things, and with them, about the shape of human life and history. I will indicate the crisis of such Christian eschatological thought in the face of 20th and 21st century developments, developments that have brought prospects which had been firmly in the religious and literary domain within pragmatic technological reach. Secondly, I will argue that eschatological horizons, questions of the last things, are as unavoidable in secular thought as they are in religious thought, and that indeed a great many aspirations of modernity rely on immanentized eschatologies that are rarely articulated, but always active. More interestingly, perhaps, I argue that these secular eschatologies suffer from what I call the antinomy of eschatology, an irreconcilable split between end as fulfillment and end as abrogation. Thirdly, I sketch some of the potential of Christian thinking to overcome such existential antinomy, a potential that other speakers, not least David, have already fleshed out in greater detail. Eschatology, then, is the study of the last things. Traditionally, these have been itemized as death, judgment, heaven and hell, but more important than these is the eschatological orientation of Christian theology as a whole. Theology recounts a story of the world, which assumes and anticipates certain ends, eschata, last things, whose character is revealed, apocalypsis unveiling in the scriptures and articulated in theological tradition. In particular, theology presents a vision of the world as created by God for the purpose of returning to him. This is a process that spans all of history and is epitomized in the human arc of creation, redemption, and sanctification, whose purpose is theosis, or participation in the divine life. As Irenaeus put it so memorably, quote, we have not been made gods from the beginning, but at first merely men, and then at length gods. For it was necessary at first that what was mortal should be conquered and swallowed up in immortality, and the corruptible by incorruptibility and that man should be made after the image and likeness of God. In other words, eschatology is the horizon against which we understand and experience the shape of the world and our place within it. For most of Christian history, the biblical promise of Christ's second coming, followed by the resurrection of the dead, the last judgment, and the advent of the heavenly Jerusalem, guided people's understanding both of their own actions and of the times that they lived in. That promise had both a moral and a historical dimension. Morally, it set all actions within the purview of an omniscient judgment to come, regardless of current inequalities and deceptions and abuses. At the last, the all-seeing God would weigh all deeds and judge people equitably. 
Historically, this horizon ordered all events within a divine drama, leading through anguish to triumph. Suffering, humiliation, and persecution were no more than the biblically foretold birth pangs of the Messianic kingdom. Throughout Christian history, religious conflicts arose from disagreements over how rightly to map biblical prophecy onto current events, whether, for example, the Pope should be understood as the vicar of Christ presiding over the thousand-year messianic reign, or uh, as the Antichrist beguiling the faithful. But these disputes did not touch the explanatory framework itself. The pressing religious question, in other words, was not how the drama of history and life were plotted, but only what role each was playing in it. The Enlightenment, by challenging the reliability of revelation as a source of historical and metaphysical knowledge, invariably changed this. After all, the last things were paradigmatically revealed knowledge. It was from the sayings of Christ and from apocalyptic biblical and post-biblical texts that the divine plan of salvation and judgment was known. The Enlightenment crisis of revelation was therefore, perhaps foremost, a crisis of eschatology. If Christian morality and world history were determined by their end, and the reliability of knowledge about that end was radically in question, how should one continue to talk about moral and historical action? The form, as much as the content of Pascal's wager, was a paradigmatic response to that crisis of skepticism. From Kant and Schleiermacher onwards, therefore, theologians and philosophers, but also theologians, no longer felt able to rely solely on biblical testimony for their assessment of moral action or their expectation of the direction and end of history. Instead, they tried to find supposedly more reliable sources of knowledge about the last things, which was still framed in broadly biblical terms, in reason and experience. This led to a large-scale shift shaping much of 19th century thought. From understanding the eschatological kingdom foretold by scripture as the act of a transcendent God judging his creation, to reading it as the outworking of an intrinsic movement of history in which God was seen to some extent to be imminent as a guiding world spirit. In the traditional view of an ordaining or even inbreaking God, it had been questions of judgment that loomed largest in eschatology. In the imagination of an indwelling world spirit, it was questions of potentiality. 19th century eschatology from Schleiermacher to Ritschel was dominated by a theological optimism about the continuation of human progress beyond death or crisis, and a corresponding skepticism about traditional doctrines such as the eternal duration of post-mortal punishment in hell. Universalism was by far the dominant opinion among progressive theologians in the 19th century. However, this consensus of an upward trajectory and of an indwelling God shattered amid the crises of the early 20th century. When all hopes of the Great War as a decisive point in an upward trajectory of history dissolved, earlier historicist systems were largely displaced by a new historicism, now in the sense of the German historismus, uh, in other words, history as irreducibly contingent, conflicting, and directionless. Vis-a-vis -vis religion, historicists of this new type aimed to uncover the particular circumstances, actors, and influences on Christianity in its historical development. While Hegelian theologies had tended to assert a historical trajectory culminating in an immanentized eschaton, eschatology within these historicist approaches, in other words, within approaches that looked at history as contingent uh, and non-directional, eschatology within these approaches was seen rather as a mark of the primitive apocalyptic mindset that irretrievably separated early Christianity from enlightened Christendom. For Johannes Weiss and Albert Schweitzer, for example, Jesus preached an imminent end of history which did not, in fact, arrive. Later Christianity was forced to construct an institutional system of power, thought, and ethics on the ruins of a disappointed eschatological expectation. 
primitive biblical eschatology or apocalypticism for the history of religion scholars of that time, the early 20th, late 19th century, confirmed the historicist thesis that even religions must be seen within their particular historical contexts rather than as timeless deposits of faith or highways to the fulfillment of history. In other words, the historicists pointed to biblical apocalypticism as a prime example of an early, very contingent sort of religious mindset which had to be left behind in the development of a mature Christianity. But unexpectedly, Protestant theologians took the stumbling block of New Testament apocalypticism with deadly seriousness. The late 19th century biblical scholar Franz Overbeck, a profound influence on Barth and others, pointed with urgency to the absolute contrast between the ascetic apocalypticism of the early Christians, which represented a radical rejection of any hope of salvation within the world and time, and the subsequent establishment of a Christian theology and church, which secularized and historicized the church. This later historicization, Overbeck thought, was not only a departure from earliest Christian thought, but a profound betrayal and self-deception because it assumed the impossible possibility of a domestication of faith by reason and of achieving within history what could only be attained by history's end. The young Karl Barth read Overbeck as having cleared the ground for a radical expectation of the inbreaking of God into the individual's life against and apart from all human securities and establishments. History, Barth conceded, would not move confidently towards fulfillment. If there was to be eschatological judgment or fulfillment of any kind, it might resemble the apocalyptic vision of the Bible more than imminentist optimism. Eschatological fulfillment, in other words, must be seen not as completing, but as opposing the flow of history, either by revolutionary force or, as in Bart's case, by eliding history altogether. The dialectical theologians, including Bart and uh, his, fo his fellows, presented eschatology as both an affirmation and a revaluation of historicism, of historicist relativism. History, in its determination by causal chains and the play and jostle of human wills, was separated by an infinite qualitative difference from the eternal will of God, who could, which could therefore manifest itself only as history's crisis, not as its fulfillment. The eschatological inbreaking of God for them effect, effected the redemption of the individual from time rather than the redemption of time. Bultmann would later state provocatively that with the cross, the definitive crisis of all reality, history has reached its end. This eschatology of the absolute moment, as Ernst Trelch critically described it, remained a dominant paradigm for several decades. But the attrition of the Second World War changed the character of Christian eschatological thought yet again. Early 20th century eschatologies had been propelled by the perceived gulf between the early church and the present. In the concentration and prison camps of the 1930s and 40s, however, the experience of the earliest Christians, afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, carrying in the body the death of Jesus, turned from irrecoverable then to pressing now. In this context, the dominant mood of eschatology became hope, and its dominant theme, the power of God's future to transform humanity's past and present. The leading theologians of this new generation were Jürgen Moltmann and Wolfhard Pannenberg, both wartime converts to Christianity. Both Moltmann and Pannenberg built their accounts of history on the recognition that the eschatology of the absolute moment of the dialectical theologians did not reject history as such, but only history on its historicist construction. In other words, for Moltmann and Pannenberg, the dialectical theologians had given away too much by simply agreeing to the definition of history as certainly contingent, 
uh, irrecoverably competitive and non-directional. They endeavored not to confirm this history-denying eschatology, but to reimagine history itself as anticipatory of God's coming. In other words, for them, eschatology led to a different definition of history um, rather than history crowding out any eschatology uh, that would take history into account. For both Moltmann and Kahnenberg in their different ways, the eschatological future is thus neither a mere extension of time nor perpendicular to time, but transforms time retroactively. For both theologians, as for those who followed them, especially Robert Jensen, what is eschatologically new, and I'm quoting Jensen here, what is eschatologically new itself creates its own continuity, since it does not annihilate the old, but gathers it up and creates it anew. It is not that another creation takes the place of this one. This perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. This revolutionary view of history as being retroactively determined by its end created immense questions for Christian eschatology, specifically for the claims that, that it saw itself as making vis-a-vis -vis the experienced ordinary reality they lived in. And I don't have the sense uh, that Christian theologians and eschatologists have really followed through on what it means, uh, what the implications are of particularly Pannenberg's uh, and to some extent Jensen's views of eschatology as redefining history as we're living it. I will leave this question hanging for a moment and turn towards the second strand of my talk, which concerns the question of secular eschatologies. So far I have talked about Christian eschatology with the aim of making us think about what I have called the quality of our hope and the shifting ways in which this has been understood in relation to history and to everyday reality. And I'm convinced that we as theologians have to think about the quality of our hope, about our views of eschatology, if we want to offer um, an intervention in, in secular thought and want to think about the future. But it is equally important to remember that it is not only people of faith who have an eschatology or orient themselves eschatologically. Insofar as eschatology asks about the end of life and the shape of history, it comprises questions that humans always already confront and assumptions that they always already inhabit. Eschatological expectations do and always will form part of the way we understand and experience the shape of the world and our place within it, even though they may remain implicit or inchoate. These expectations function as the horizons within or towards which movement becomes possible and intelligible. Philosophers including Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, Rosenzweig, Berdyaev, Heidegger, and others knew this, all deliberately anchored their understanding of life or history in a projected end, in light of which human moral and creative endeavors made sense. The story of modernity is thus, in many respects, a story of the transposition of eschatology. Bereft of revelation, secular moderns, as Jakob Taubes and Karl Lovett and others have argued, have constructed new eschatologies. And usually, this means that they have secularized eschatology in the technical sense of transposing the eternal into the seculum, the age of the present world. If the Enlightenment crisis of revelation was also a crisis of eschatology, then the rise of secularization was, among other things, a transposition of eschatology, a multifaceted endeavor to immanentize the eschaton. Such immanentized eschatology is a staple of political rhetoric and vision building, comprising messianic promises, apocalyptic imprecations, and socially engineered utopias, and perhaps even versions of integralism. It is also a driving desire of technologies that seek to overcome <coughs> death and perfect human life. All this, all these, anchor human endeavor in a desire to achieve the last things, the fulfillment of humans' most profound desires for knowledge, freedom, goodness, communion, power, or security. And yet, and this is the central claim of this second part of my talk, the systems that we create to achieve these desires 
almost invariably pursue them in such ways as to disfigure either their subjects or their objects. This, I maintain, is not a coincidental flaw, but a constitutive antinomy as intractable as Kant's antinomies of reason, what we might call the antinomy of secular eschatology. This antinomy concerns the irreducible tension between end as consummation and end as cessation. I do not have the time to demonstrate here, though I've done so elsewhere, how this antinomy plays out in key areas of the philosophies of Kant and Hegel. In our context, it is more pressing to uncover its workings in political and technological eschatologies. The tension between consummation and cessation is perhaps most evident in historical political eschatologies on both <coughs> the left and the right. These systems generally pursue collective fulfillment, yet they achieve it, if at all, only at the cost of redefining out of recognition either fulfillment or those who obtain it. The German Catholic convert Eric Peterson was an incisive critic of such systems' failures to observe precisely an eschatological reserve, an eschatologischer Ausstand, and his thought has not yet been exhausted as a resource for the future. More complex collective eschatologies, including ascendant varieties of transhumanism, also pursue fulfillment, but acknowledge that this fulfillment is likely to bring the end of the world as we know it. It is not humans, but their successor AIs who will inherit the kingdom. Martin Heidegger, since we're obliged to bring up Heidegger in our talks as a sort of condition of speaking at this conference, <laughs> is one of the most sophisticated secular eschatological thinkers of the 20th century, partly because he confronts this antinomy uncompromisingly, not denying, but embracing it. Human existence for him just is to live not towards fulfillment, but towards its impossibility. Humans, Heidegger maintains, are never fully defined or realized in the present moment, but depend for their identity on a future that they can neither foresee nor control. To know or to be oneself fully, one would have to be able to survey the whole of oneself, to have a grasp of the whole of oneself, which is always dependent on one's future decisions and circumstances, but there is no such whole not only because there are always unrealized possibilities, but also because the ultimate and inavertable possibility of human existence is death. And so if death marks the completion of my life, and thus the point at which I could finally say, here is all of myself, this is me, I'm no longer there to do so. Human life is therefore for Heidegger most authentically lived in conscious acceptance of this impossibility as a being unto death. And yet, and yet, for all of Heidegger's heroism of finitude, his account depends for its pathos entirely on the assumption of a desire for transcending finitude, which he cannot and does not even attempt to account for. The passionate acts of shattering oneself against death or bearing its affliction, which characterize authentic human existence, are predicated on a contrary longing, which Heidegger's analysis assumes as consistently as it obfuscates it, just as the existentialists' claims of meaninglessness are predicated on the assumption or demand for a meaning which their own systems simply cannot ground. Third and last part. The implicit argument of the preceding part has been that secular eschatologies, eschatologies which transpose the eschaton into the seculum, characteristically face an antinomy which is mirrored in the current disintegration of the human in the technological utopia. The argument of this final part is that Christian eschatology overcomes both this disintegration and this antinomy through a radical theological anthropology rooted in an eschatological understanding of humans as created in the image of God. The expectation of the eschata, of resurrection, judgment, and eternal life is rooted in biblical and creedal statements that the dead will rise, that Christ will judge them, and that he will gather his elect unto life everlasting. These claims are not fanciful flights of the apocalyptic imagination, though their spectacular and sometimes even lurid depictions throughout history can make it seem so. Rather, 
They define the very fabric of creation and humanity as Christianity envisions them. In this system, creation is a gift expressing the love that is the Trinitarian life of God. The human vocation is to be drawn at the last into that triune life of God, that love between Father, Son, and Spirit, which defines the divine nature or life and overflows into the creation of a non-divine world. However, this deification is not a calling that is attainable by human capacities. This is because to be like God does not consist, as Adam and Eve were tempted into believing in the Genesis myth, in achieving autonomy, but in being drawn, and I quote Thomas Aquinas, above the condition of our nature to a participation in the divine good. Therefore, and this is Aquinas again, although man by his nature is ordained to beatitude as his end, he is ordained to attain this end, not by his own strength, but only by the help of grace, which draws him into the love of God. This grace is poured out through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. As the church fathers never tired of saying, God became man so that man could become God. Death, once the punishment for sin, was here transformed from within into a means of sharing the death and resurrection of Christ and so moving towards that life with God, which is the innermost human calling. This dynamic sublates the antinomy of, of eschatology, partly because it does not insist on a linear uh, or even a dialectical progression from within to an end that cannot but be its own dissolution, but rather because it embraces both dissolution and fulfillment and understands each through the other, cross through resurrection and resurrection through cross. The New Testament promises of the kingdom, in other words, are not simply utopian. They do not project a linear completion of human potentiality. Instead, they require the death of the old Adam and renewed birth with Christ, the firstborn from the dead. This death and rebirth with Christ mark the distinctively Christian interpretation of the claim appearing in both Jewish and Christian scriptures that humans are created in the image of God. For St. Paul and St. John, this means not merely that humans are like God, e.g. in being rational, but that they are united to Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Both authors describe this union in language of sight. Thus, Paul writes to the Corinthians, now that Christ has been revealed, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Curiously, Paul regards this not merely as a present, but ultimately as an eschatological reality. The transformation that he describes will not be complete until the eschaton. Thus, Paul also writes, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even if, as I have been fully known. And John echoes, beloved, we are now the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he comes, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. In other words, the New Testament authors imagine a time, not yet, when humans will see Christ face to face at the parousia, and it is then that they will also understand themselves in relationship to and reflection of him in whose image they are. This is in some ways very far from an intuitive anthropology, contrary to the assumption of a basic and immediate epistemological access to the self, which is prerequisite to all other knowledge. St. Paul here projects knowledge or vision of God as the most direct form of self-knowledge. In the eschaton, St. Paul suggests, humans will know themselves not by reflecting on themselves, but by beholding God and being beheld by him. There is also an obverse side to this. If humans cannot see themselves entirely accurately in self-reflection, then this is also because the deepest wellspring of their identity is to be created, sustained, and called in love. There is no I apart from that I as loved by God, and there is no accurate view of the I except as loved. This too is part of the sense of Paul's vision we now see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know fully even as we are fully known. This vision of humans 
as existentially incomplete complicates what we might say about dwelling in the world because it bespeaks a restlessness that is not contingent but constitutive of our existence in the world. In our relationship to others, no, in our relationship to ourselves, this should modulate our expectations. In our relationship to others and the world, it should modulate our attachments. But the theological account is carefully calibrated. The human desire for completion is one that neither rests content within the world nor stands over and against it. All human relationships of love anticipate it and all care for the world prepares for it. And this, I would say, is the quality of our hope and it cannot be asserted, it can only be lived. Thank you.